essayist. Uh, you're in for a treat. He's a great storyteller. Now he's shaking his head because it's like, oh, you put the pressure on me. A lot of you have probably restored a house, or maybe worked on an old car, or decided to renovate um, an older home, and, or even just decided to you bought a Victorian home or a period home and wanted to put period furniture in it. You spent several years looking to, uh, to match all those things up with whatever age it was. Uh, my next essay is to imagine that the mental fortitude, if you've had that experience of restoring something or remaking something or trying to get period pieces, imagine the mental fortitude and determination that it takes to restore an entire river and improving the wildlife and the botany of thousands of square miles of Indian River Basin. That has been the more than 20 year quest for our next reader, Dr. Jerry Sweeten. Dr. Sweeten taught biology at Manchester University where he is Professor Emeritus of Biology and Environmental Studies. He owns and operates today with his wife Melinda Ecosystems Connections Institute in Denver, Indiana. Please welcome Dr. Jerry Sweeney. Thanks, Avon, and, and, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, and first thing I'd like to do is thank Avon. Avon has spent I don't know how many hours. Um, dysfunctional emails that I get once in a while trying to figure out what he's trying to say. And I, I think we owe him a, a round of applause. <laughs> and, I, and, and the team. I mean, there's been a team of people I know. Nothing happens in a vacuum. And uh, everyone. And, and, and it's a, a real honor to even have been asked to write anything for, for a document like this. I'm out of my element. This is, this is not usually the type of venue that I produce or to present data. <clears throat> but, but the other thing I think is really special about this book, and I sincerely appreciate it, Avon, you doing this, and that is dedicating this to the professional natural resource managers that work for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. And <clears throat> There's probably not another agency in our state government that has the largest budget reduction target on its chest. And it has been dismantled, disfigured for decades because no one complains about cutting money from the DNR budget. And we have probably the best bargain of professional natural resource managers in that, in that state agency. And when I read that and you told me, I thought, wow, I've never seen that before, and, and, and thanks for doing that. So, I am um, a restoration limnologist by training, and I, I, I'm going to tell you this quick story about, uh, I used the word limnology, and I used to teach a class called limnology, and I had a student come into my office, and I want to sign for that limnology class. I said, okay. He said, by the way, is that, is that a study of trees? Is that limbs? What are we going to study? <laughs> and of course, the mythology is the study of freshwater lakes, streams, and marshes. And, and it, was, it was hard to hold back anything other than just a gentle smile and, and uh, encourage this young person to get involved. But it, 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 there's probably nothing more important uh, in the next phase of this conversation than to nurture a place where the next generation of all of us will come and pick the baton. And there's been some information presented about native cultures, beautiful, the Isaac Walton, the condition of water, lakes and streams and rivers used to be in the bad old days. Um, and what we don't know as scientists, we don't know what it was like for sure during the indigenous people's time here. And so the work that I do, I do in the rears of trying to understand when is a system clean? When is, in, when is our work done? Uh, let me give you just a real quick example, and I'm going to read. Uh, Indiana is about 23 million acres in size. We know that original Indiana was about a 20 million acre forest. Now an acre is about the size of a football field. 
Water doesn't care if it's in Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan. It always goes downhill. And, and it can't run north, by the way. Um, and so, you know, we don't know what it was like. And so it's probably one of the more challenging parts of the science of restoring these systems that, that we face uh, in, in trying to understand how it works. And I was just very fortunate to have been in a place and in a position to have the opportunity to work with a great group of collaborators to work on the Eel River uh, in, in the northern part of our state. And so what I, what I try to do, so I want to just explain these, this part of my writing. I didn't want to just write science stuff. I wanted to tell the story of how the Eel Basin was restored to its present day uh, after some of the, the trauma that it has experienced. And so I, I intertwined some of my personal, my own personal journey as a reason to sort of inspire the next young person who might read this. I've been watching these young kids out here and, and you, you just don't know who, who that might be. So that was sort of the rationale for that. And I, and I wanted to share the restoration story of the Little River uh, as an education model and a model for other scientists that yes, it can be done given enough time and money. And, and so with that, I'm going to read just three parts of different parts. The first part I call the origins, and so you can bear with that story. And then a little story about raising young biologists and finding the upshot, what I call the upshot. So, I want to first start out with a, a quote from Aldo Leopold, and I hope all of you can relate to this. Leopold says, one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Much of the damage inflicted on land is quite invisible to laymen. Ecologists must, must either harden their shells and make believe the consequences of science are none of their business, or they must be the doctor who sees the marks of death on a community that believes itself well and does not want to be told otherwise. As a city kid growing up in the north end of Kokomo, Indiana, frequent vacations to a small fishing cabin on Bruce Lake was nothing short of living in a wilderness, albeit only 50 miles from home and a few weeks of the year. Bruce Lake was a shallow lake of about 245 acres, and it's in Pulaski and Fulton counties. Looking in the rearview mirror of life provides the context to experiences at Bruce Lake as fertile soil for the development of the life journey of this writer as a limnologist. Rachel Carson, American biologist and author, influenced influential 1962 conservation book, Silent Spring, wrote, a child's world is fresh and beautiful, full of wonder and excitement. It is our misfortune for most of us that clear-eyed vision, that true instinct for what is beautiful and awe-inspiring is dimmed and even lost before we reach adulthood. If I had the influence with the good fairy who is supposed to preside over the christening of all children, I should ask her gift to each child in the world be a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last throughout life as an unfailing antidote against the boredom and disenchantments of later years, the sterile preoccupation with things that are artificial, the alienation from the source of our strength. If a child is to keep alive their inborn sense of wonder without any such good gift from the fairies, they need the companionship of at least one adult who, who can share it, rediscovering with them the joy, excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. Adults, especially mothers, have a sixth sense and a vision for life journeys, selflessly making personal sacrifice to spend time nurturing a sense of wonder. While never outwardly expressed, my mother knew that my childhood vacations were the origins of a passion for lakes, streams, and fishing. Bruce Lake was a wilderness with endless adventure. Places to explore were very different from our neighborhood. These adventures are forever deeply embedded, and they became the rock of 
teaching and scientific philosophies. They became the beginnings of restoring the Eel River. In September 1971, my parents brought most of my earthly possessions, including my favorite fishing gear, at the back door of Schwamm Hall at Manchester College. While mathematics suggested uh, this may have been uh, 50 years or so ago, the memory of that day is so vivid it seems only a few years ago. At the time I accepted it, the college had to be an error by someone who was tasked to evaluate applicants with strong indicators of success at college. There must have been a mistake. The appeal at the college campus was not academics for me, but rather the fact that it was bordered by the Eel River, known for great smallmouth bass fishing. Birthright jobs in Kokomo were factory positions in the automobile industry, and young people in my neighborhood rarely ventured off to college. The probability of success of a first-generation college student who was addicted to fishing had to be especially low within the context of a high school teacher's comment that went something like this to me. Don't waste your time going to college. You're not college material. Well, despite this advice, standing at the back door of Schwalm Hall was the origin of a professional journey founded on faith and unknown outcomes. College students generally are clueless relative to four years of academia. Hometown peers, my hometown peers, often inquired about the rationale to attend college while sacrificing good money at the factory. There were, there were no good answers to these questions, uh, only a journey that was set in motion catching bluegills chasing frogs at Bruce Lake. Academia and the college process were like driving in a fog. However, the next four years were transforming and served as the foundation for a professional career only remotely imaginable. Four years passed quickly. In 1975, there was a diploma in hand for the biology and environmental studies degree, albeit with an academic record that was mildly average. <laughs> This was a small but significant twist in the journey to restoration of the Eel River, past skipping classes to go fishing. Rather, the Manchester College journey led to a master's degree of, uh, from Ball State University and a PhD in Lithology from Purdue University as a non-traditional student. Later, I learned that this meant I was old. <laughs> Who would have thought? Perhaps the greatest irony of this journey was a day in 2004 when a teaching position in biology and director of environmental studies at Manchester College was offered. And I accepted by the same kid who grew up on in the north end of Kokomo. Intervention from a higher being. 
While electrofishing the research site in North Manchester, a severe thunderstorm siren went off in town. It's important to mention at this point, at this experience, that it predates cell phones and weather radar apps in the field. Having just completed collecting fish from the experimental site, the storm arrived quickly along with strong winds, rain, and plenty of lightning. The entire group quickly beached the boat on a sandbar about 100 feet upstream of the Market Street Bridge. One of the IBNR interns and I were tasked with making sure the boat did not dislodge from the sandbar and float downstream while everyone else scampered for the bridge. After securing the boat, the intern and I both made a straightway path to the bridge. But about halfway there, a lightning bolt stuck a tree along the riverbank somewhere close. It was, it was one of those bright flashes followed by immediately by a frightfully loud crash of thunder. Our pace increased. The strike was so close enough that it raised the hairs on my arm from static electricity generated by the strike, or perhaps it was just fear. Once safely under the bridge, the intern, who was wearing chest waders at the time, looked at Ed Braun and me, and with a sheepish voice said, I don't have to pee anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it was an adventure in the category of indes indescribable intervention from a higher being that day. And finally, I want to read uh, the upshot. I'm leaving out a lot of details that we did to, re to restore the river basin. It's in, the, in here. I think you'll enjoy it. It's, we're still continuing that research, by the way. Um, so anyway, here we go, the upshot. The Yale River's been a journey overflowing with scientific endeavors and founded on grace, hope, professional logic, serendipity, hard work, sensitivity toward the past, present, and future, and a dedicated group of collaborators with an endless sense of wonder. Thinking about the upshot efforts collectively conjured up a memory. A few years into my tenure at Manchester College, an administrator told me I was working too many hours. During our conversations, he informed me that working for an institution business of any kind makes no difference after, after you're gone. This was a bewildering concept to me and he explained it in more detail. He shared the following analogy to illustrate his, his world view of work. When you stick your finger in a glass of water and fill it out, this is how much of a hole you leave when you're gone. This was a novel concept. It generated sincere sympathy for him, and it shook my philosophic, philosophical ship slightly. While this analogy was shared in good faith, it is unquestionably misguided and just plain wrong. <coughs> it may be grateful to be a professor and to be a restoration of knowledge. If there is any one endeavor that would rival mentoring young biologists, it would have to be restoring restoration of knowledge. Collaborative hands who have put their fingers in the Eel River restoration glass of water and pulled them out did not leave a hole, but a mountain of accomplishments. The healing of the Yale River will persist into perpetuity, and it has given voice to that which had no voice, and endured relentless, indiscriminate ecological trauma for decades. <coughs> Working in partnership with so many wonderful people, including many students, toward a common goal is unquestionably the most humbling and gratifying experience of any professional career. With gratitude, all involved made a difference both in the Eel River itself and for all those in the past, present, and future who will find great joy, peace, and gratitude at the Eel River. Plus, we had fun. Thanks. To uh, everyone for coming, uh, I want to um, uh, thank everybody involved in this project again. And uh, we have some books. If you want to read any of the essays in their entirety and see some of the uh, 100 or see all the 100 pieces of art, 
If um, you don't get a chance to uh, get a book, remember uh, the 60 of those pieces are on exhibit at uh, the Indiana State Museum through December 12th. So thank you for coming and I encourage you all to stay after and uh, talk to some of the writers and myself and if there's any questions right now before we break, uh, I'll try to answer those. I just had one question. Um, you're the, the artist to visualize. Yes. Could you just say a little bit about what you hope? Jason says something about not wanting to just look at the rivers, at, you know, on the surface, but go into the history. And what you hope that people will get from looking at the art and, and reading the essays side by side, sure. particularly the art. Um, the, the project, as I said, started out as a bunch of artists finding something to do and it quickly evolved in trying to connect it to a uh, social need. And that social need uh, was conservation and awareness of what our rivers, streams, and tributaries needed. The uh, artists then decided to use their skills to find, we could have very easily included a lot of the uh, problems that you see uh, every place we went there was trash along the riverside. We could have painted that in. Our approach was, let's show people the beauty that is there, what we didn't choose to include. They're going to see when they go out to these beautiful rivers and streams. And our goal of using this art was, if it got them to go visit a stream or a, or a tributary that they hadn't before, just by seeing the beautiful art, they would suddenly look around and see some of the things that we saw that were wrong. And this conservation uh, message that this book holds through the essays will hopefully then bring them back. If, you know, a lot of people will get a nice pretty picture book and they'll look at the pictures and read a few captions and maybe start an essay. And then maybe when they go out to see some of these uh, waterways, they'll, let me take a closer look at that book and they'll start to discover some of the things that we didn't paint that need to be done. It's amazing. One of the artists uh, writes in his preference, each artist at the beginning of their section of paintings will tell a little bit about their experience. And one artist said, you know, I've had my tires changed on my car uh, many times throughout my lifetime, but never once that I tell the people who change my tires, throw those in the trunk. I'm going to take them down to the river and throw them in. Because almost every place you go along one of these rivers, there's old tires. There's appliances. There's uh, office chairs. And you would think that the people who look to go and fish, like Jerry, he, he went to college because he wanted to fish small islands <laughs> in the Eel River. <laughs> the college education was just a, you know, an add-on. <laughs> so, thankfully, it was more than that. Sure. But you'd be surprised. All these people who fish, when you go down to these rivers, it's not only soft drink cans and soft drink styrofoam. It's styrofoam bait boxes that are left by the fishermen. And you would think that they, of all people, would carry out what they carry in. They're just left there floating along the banks. Anyone else have a question before we break to informal discussions? I, I, I'd just like to sort of respond to that as well. There's a section in, in my essay which I, I did not read because it's long and it's, it's sort of disconnected from some of the rest of it, so taking it out of context wouldn't have made sense for it. I was up in Muncie with my friend Peter here, uh, an art historian, and we went to an art gallery there, and I came across a painting by a man named Richard Mayhew, um, and I talk a lot about that painting because he, he says, I am painting the treaty land that was never honored for Native Americans, but I look at the painting, and I would not have known that if right, that information was not on the, 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 the placard there that described it. So I have a, a take three or four pages where I kind of reflect on like, well, what does that mean, right? 
how are we supposed to approach a work of art? And what can we do as viewers of art to more than just say, oh wow, that's really pretty, I like the colors, or I love that scene, right? It's sort of, I think what Mayhew is doing in his work is encouraging us to spend more time with art and to challenge our sort of traditional habits of viewing it, which are very much shaped by the culture that we're in. Oh, we look at something, we spend a couple of minutes with it, it pleases us aesthetically or not, and then we move on to the next thing. It's like, you know, slow down, sit and think about this, learn a little bit about the artist, right? Where are they coming from? What is their philosophy? Uh, a lot of the artists in the book talk about how I had to get permission to go on private property in order to gain access to this waterway. So, right, then you begin to think, oh, why do you have to get permission to go see a river? Because of, right, how we understand land and land ownership. So the more you can sort of, I think, move beyond that initial encounter, hopefully. Jason's got a great point there about that access. If you look up public access sites, which is typically where people go to launch canoes, kayaks, and boats into a waterway uh, or a lake, and there's like 300 and some in Indiana, but there's 62,000 plus miles of tributary. The majority of those are inaccessible because they are uh, they're abutted with uh, private land. The only way that I, as an artist, was able to get places was to get into a public access point and walk up or down the river from that point. So we agree. And I was basically trespassing because in Indiana, it only navigable. Um, Waterway is designated natural, which surprisingly we put our canoes and kayaks in uh, in public spaces, and that is not considered navigable. Jerry could give you the definition of that probably, but uh, it's usually bigger waterways where barges and things like that might be down. So, yeah, public access was a big problem. So, so actually, that designation is quite arbitrary. Is it? Yes. So there's some very small streams that are considered navigable and others that are, most are non-navigable. And so there, there is no uh, formula for that designation. But we have in Indiana what's called a common rights law or vegetarian rights law, where if it's a non-navigable stream, you own the property, you own the bottom of the river. And so technically on, in a stream like that, this is really weird, you can float down it, but if, if you get out of the canoe, Step on the river, you're technically trespassing. So I was trespassing many times. Well, I never tried to do it. Because I could not walk around water. 